you got a lot of really good specialists out there and, and they all bring a different thing to the table. So, uh, you know, when it comes to it, you know, we're always looking for, you know, in general, an athletic snapper, someone who's consistent, someone who carries themselves um, very, very well mentally and, and just like their, their demeanor on the field is, is someone we're always looking for. They call me the Iceman. I, I try to make the world shrink to about a three yard by three yard little spot. Not even, I couldn't even really see the front line in front of me. It was my holder and me and my few little steps. For you guys that, that may know Brett but don't know, I mean, the guy knows what he's talking about. Man, y'all order my dog's book, man. Look, the Kicker's Bible. Welcome, specialists. Coaches, dads of kickers, moms of punters, relatives of long snappers, and dogs that shag kickoffs to the Iceman Podcast. It's the show with cold questions and even cooler guests, and I'm your host, Brett Raquelian. I'm joined today by three outstanding guests. Get ready to be schooled in the art of long snapping. So today, this first guest, guest comes on. He had a brief stint uh, with the Sacramento Mountain Lions and later workouts with the Jets. He's worked with 56 and counting uh, professional long snappers, including, but not limited to, multiple NFL veterans, all pro selections, and now a Hall of Famer, okay? Such as Luke Rhodes, Ross Mastic, Zach Wood, Casey Kreider, and his two most impressive subjects to come on today, Christian Kuntz and Jacob Bobenmeyer. Uh, snappers are athletes. I will, I do have to say, I, I want to make it clear. I want everyone to know that. And as a former specialist, I can identify with it. This guy was an all conference tight end in high school, uh, blocked a punt, even was a long snapper had, in 2014, received all state honors and was a dual sport athlete. He threw the shot put and ran the four by one was an FCS walk on at the university of Northern Colorado. Big Sky team, shout out to the Big Sky. Spent time at UC Davis there, so I, I can support that, okay? He's played with the Denver Broncos and is currently a snapper with the Long, uh, Las Vegas Raiders, Jacob Bopenmeyer. And this last guy, this last guy, okay? Only the second Duquesne football player in 68 years to secure a spot on an NFL roster and more than just a long snapper in college. He had 30 and a half career sacks and 71 and a half tackles. Yeah, he was named to the Northeast Conference Mount Rushmore in 2020 mm -hmm. as one of the four greatest players in the 40-year history of the conference. And he is also now a member of the Duquesne Athletics Hall of Fame. Give it up for Christian Kuntz. <laughs> all right, so Thank hey, you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, before we even get into it, all right, I, I, I have this heavy hitter section, okay, and – you know, I was going to ask something about snapping and how are they misunderstood and all that other BS. Okay. But Christian, okay. Who had the better undercover video? Was it you or Ray Lewis from this year's Super Bowl? I'm not sure if you saw it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I'm kind of mad. I so you're, you're not the first person to bring that up, but I haven't seen it yet. I wish I could pull it up right now and watch it. But He, he, um, does, he does a very horrible Rastafarian uh, impression. <laughs> I mean, dude, he's pretty hard to kind of like disguise. I'm not gonna lie. If we, <laughs> if he's, Ray Lewis is a hard guy to disguise, so I feel like my pro mine was probably a little better. You know, according to you, in that video too, you said that you had more sacks in college than T.J. Watt. Is there any truth to that? It's just facts. It's facts. <laughs> <laughs> I he love knows that, it I, too, and he knows it. I, I wouldn't know about it. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that, and the the total Pittsburgh uh old guy that came up to you and he said we're here to see Santonio Holmes and you oh, that was so funny <laughs> Santonio Holmes <laughs> <laughs> the Yinzers man they're crazy here in Pittsburgh yeah crazy that's, I'm one of them that's I I can hear I it's very to a west coast guy like me it's very uh you know Pat McAfee-esque I'm sure you get that all the time so yeah yeah um, yeah you gotta deal with that He's on ESPN, so it can't be that bad. It can't be that <laughs> ugly, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, Jacob, just like me, you're from the west part of the United States, right? You're from Wyoming. Kind of take take us through your kind of your upbringing, uh, you know, your 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 playing career, and what led you to where you are at today. 
Um, so like my par- I was born in Tokyo, Japan, actually. And then so my parents were in the Air Force. And then we moved to Wyoming eventually down the road in about sixth grade. Um, and then I kind of screwed up that way. And then in a military household. So my parents just kind of always taught me, like, if you want something, you can just work really hard and do what you got to do to get it done. You either did it or you didn't do it. Um, so one thing I wanted to do is play in the NFL. I wanted to play linebacker, so I came up slightly short, but I mean, I'll take long stepping position. In high school, I ended up breaking my foot my uh, senior year, and I kind of was behind on the recruiting train being from Wyoming. No one really recruits them. Um, so when I got to college, I walked on and, or to backtrack a little bit. So in high school, I broke my foot. I couldn't do anything in basically training camp two days, whatever. And so I learned how to do like the long snapping overhead tosses and I was in a boot. So that's the only thing I could do. Um, and then I started doing it pregame cause like, I just didn't like being in the locker room for pregame and whatnot. I just like to be out there doing whatever. So I was like, Oh, I'll just start snapping. Like, so I'd go out there and just rip like 40 balls pregame, just, <laughs> just messing around, whatever, just being out there. And then, so fast forward, I ended up walking onto UNC and then, uh we're in training camp fall camp whatever you want to call it in college and we have a long snapper and he's on scholarship and i'm like are you kidding me and i'm watching him snap and i'm like i was like i could do better than this guy like i was like I'm not trying to be a douche or anything because i was like whatever but i was like i told him my buddy's actually here at my house now but i was like dude i can snap better than this guy i think like, i can long snap and he's like all right so why don't you do it and i was like all right so then he ended up standing. I was like, I'm not going to be a long snapper. Like, I'm not doing it. And then he ended up st- standing up in a team meeting and was like, Jacob Palmer can long snap in a such team's meeting. And I was like, what is this? I was like, dude, don't. And they're like, all right, you're going to do it tomorrow. And I was like, all right. And I literally threw like 10, 15 balls. And they're like, all right, that, that, don't plan on redshirting. And I was like, okay. So fast forward about my junior year, uh, my coach kind of like, you know, you, you should take this serious. Like, I think size-wise you compare to everybody else, like, you're a good athlete, you can probably go to the league for it. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, go to the league for long snapping. Like, I don't think I can do that. And then, so he's like, you should reach out and try and find help. And he actually recommended me to Special Teams U. And I was like, Special Teams U, I wonder what else they do. And um, so I ended up messaging Kyle or emailing him or texting. I can't remember exactly. And then I ended up going out there one time. And he completely changed everything. And I, I'm not going to lie, I thought I was a shit going in there. And he just completely humbled me. Yeah. But look, yeah. And so it was really cool to kind of learn more consistent uh, variables in your snapping, like your grip, the whip, which I struggled with. I didn't think I got it to like my rookie year in the NFL. So it took me a long time to get, get the hang of it. Um, and I still, I don't think I have the hang of it. You know, there's always room for improvement, but it's a different story. Um, and so I work with him and then go to senior year and then get invited to East West Shrine Bowl, which I was like, wow, okay. So some dude, he, the other guy was at UCF and he tore his ACL or something. And it was like, yeah, I don't really care to be in the NFL or something. And then, so they, they chose me and then I ended up going there and did, did pretty well. Um, and then come back, keep trying to like train with Kyle before that, just Anytime I get the chance, I'm like, all right, I'm going to Kyle, train with Kyle, train with Kyle. Um, and it completely trained my snapping for the better. Like, it was a nine-day difference, like, almost every time I went there. Um, and then ended up – the special teams coordinator for Denver really liked the fact that I could run, kind of, for snappers in the league. Um, and then went to mini – Ricky mini camp, then – went to veteran mini camp. They ended up signing me in training camp. Then I had like two workouts, two or three workouts with them before they actually signed me. All of them were with Christian. So we got to know each other pretty well. Um, and uh, hey, man, you don't mind me. Let me interrupt real quick. Kyle, what was your first thoughts when you saw Jacob snap or, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your first impression. Yeah. So I was going to wait till he finished, but uh, I, I love telling the story because when Jacob first came and he's like, I want to play in the NFL my first reaction was like, oh, goodness, we have some work to do. Um, and I think he knew that, too, you know, especially after we broke everything down and showed him everything he had, had going on. And, you know, I think he left kind of overwhelmed. And then the next time he came back, he had improved quite a bit. Um, and then funny story. So at the East West Shrine game, 
I was training the other snapper from UCF um, and he had had a knee injury and wasn't going to attend the game. And they had asked me, Hey, who's the next best guy. And I was like, please don't screw this up. Please don't screw this up. Jacob has been improving and he's a linebacker and he's doing really well. So they ended up taking him and, and he, he did well there. Um, I was just with Chris Wilkerson. He was telling me a funny story about your very first snap at the East West Shrine game uh, that had some guys worried, but then you snap back and um, impress some people there too. So uh, it, there was a lot, a lot of improvement behind that. And, and he clearly was putting in the work, you know, when he wasn't with me. Um, and I think that made a huge difference. Yeah. And I will say too, I love the snappers mindset. Like there's so much humility. There's so much like, whatever, man, the team needs me like, screw it. I'll do it. You know, like, like even you said, Jake, like, yeah, I, you can go to the NFL for snapping. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. But you just kept working at it. Like that's such a cool kickers are divas, right? I was a kicker. 100%. Punter, and these and punters <laughs> are pretty Madonna's. So yeah, okay. So so you know what I'm where I'm coming from, right? They're they need yeah. it exactly how they need it, and they they think they're the ish, and they gone to all these camps and shit. It's like, you know, snappers just gonna grip it and rip it, right? And, and also, they're they're the lunch pal guys, and then the the kickers and punters are the they wear their capes, and then the snappers are the lunch pal guys. That's right. It's like the O line and running backs and receivers and quarterbacks. They're the pretty one. Everyone, at, we're in the trenches. All right, we're just doing we're in the, the dirty trenches. Work. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, uh, Christian, too. What was your first impression when you met Jacob and in the whole process? Brace yourselves for the Kicker's Bible. The Kicker's Bible, a specialist how-to manual, born from a decade of dedication to specialists and special teams. This ain't your average football book. It's the holy grail of great iron guidance. Dive into the wisdom of over twenty NFL specialists, including Eagles Hall of Famer. David Akers, and 15-year NFL vet and kicking guru Shane Graham as they answer your burning questions to become the best specialist that you can possibly be. Whether you're a peewee rookie or an NFL veteran, this book is your secret weapon to kicking success. It's out now. Go to www.icemankicking.com slash books or our Twitter bio at Iceman Coaching or Amazon and search The Kicker's Bible to get your copy today. Also, don't forget to subscribe. Now kick your feet up and let's get back to one cold episode. I don't know. We we I don't even know what what workout it was. I feel like we've been it was on a, a couple. it was the one in like I think August or the end of July that we had, and it was just you and I, and it was only like 20 snaps each. It was actually really nice out of the Comic Man workouts we've had. It was the, was it the a, easier was one. It, was it the one on one of the side fields? Um, it was the specialist field, the one that's like 80 yards at Denver's facility. See how many workouts these guys had? They can't even remember where they were. I had one workout. I know Chris, exactly Christian's had like 100. I've had, I haven't had that many. They've all been with the same team and like yeah, had one with Detroit. Thought- Christian's had a million. I've been about yeah. I I just remember when I saw um, Jake. I was like, damn, this dude throws a fast ball. Like he was rifling it back there, and I was a, uh, I was like comparing myself because like, you get into those workouts, and then the second you get into like comparing yourself, like to the guy, like watching the guy next to you, like you kind of screw yourself on this, like because you don't know what your ball looks like from the outside, but like I'm watching his ball, and he throws a fast ass ball, like. He's like his time's great. I'm like, oh damn, like this dude's rifling, and I think it kind of like messed with me. Then I tried throwing it real hard and started missing my spots. But yeah, we 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 uh we've been on a couple. I feel like together, but we we're always like, yeah, let's just get out there and let it rip. Who cares? Yeah, kind of the mindset, and, that, and that's the thing. Like as specialists, like competing, like even the special I competed with to get the job in Denver, we were like. You know, like, we're both going to hopefully have jobs at the end of this. Like, you may not – one of us obviously isn't going to be here, but, you know, we're like, we're going to have jobs. And we just, like, try and get each other better and, like, give yeah. each other tips and stuff. It's very, like, amicable versus it being, like, oh, screw that guy. You know, like, you know, like, oh, you're like oh, – because I feel like as a – you don't get pumped when the other person throws a bad snap, you know, because, like, you 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 get like that karma comes around and bites you in the ass and then you're gonna throw two yeah. bad snaps you know you just gotta go and like 100%. kind of blind it out and just 
worry about what you can control and that's how you snap the ball and like how everything plays out from there is you just got to go with it. Yeah, I think that's, that's one thing I don't think a lot of high school kids understand. So just like cheering for other snappers and, and you're really not competing against that. I mean, you don't got to You don't got to cheer for them, but like don't right. get pumped when they mess up, you know, like because you still are competing competitive. against yourself. Like if Christian goes out there and he's he's ten for ten ripping darts, I'm like, dude, you you whipped ass today. I'm not gonna lie, hmm. like, yeah, you know. But I'm but if he goes out there and snaps shitty, I'm not gonna be like, oh, dude, I'm so glad you did bad. Like I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> not not at all. And also, Jake, too, that was actually one of my questions for all three of you guys. All three of you guys have gone to workouts, and for the outsider or you know just an average fan, I mean, the the amount of pressure it would seem going into those workouts is intense. Like, you know, I'm sure in the back of your mind, there's something telling you like, Hey, I can't have a bad ball or, you know, I need, I need this to make the team. What is your guys' mindset when you go into that? And how do you come out better? You hit on it a little bit, but. I guess I'll take that first. Uh, and, and you guys can follow up if you'd like to. Uh, but I, I do think a lot of the times going into stressful situations, um, it comes down to the, the more, you know, the more prepared you are, the easier it becomes. So if you don't know the cause and effect of, of your snap, what you do to make a correction, um, if you don't have confidence in your technique, then it's hard to be um, successful in those situations. So I think both these guys have been working and are always continuously uh, improving on just the understanding of what they're doing. Um, and I think a lot of guys struggle with that and that they just focus on, hey, I'm going to take a deep breath and hopefully all this nervousness goes away. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if they can just, uh, focus on the details it, at the end of the day, it just takes care of itself. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. Let, like, if you don't trust your technique going into these workouts and you, you're already done, if you're not trusting what you're doing and believing in it and like knowing that it works going into these workouts, you're just, you're setting yourself behind. Yeah. And like building off that you kind of have to understand like there's a reason why you're there so it's like oh i don't want to disappoint them or whatever it's like no they're here because they see something in me and you should like have the desire to elaborate on it and it's like even though it's just a workout it's almost like it feels like a game like it just like another way of competing and just having like at the end of the day it is what it is you're you're not going to get any better in that 30 minutes you're snapping so it's like just grip it and rip it and have fun and and you know let it let it go and yeah. just go snap. Just do what I mean, you do all the time when you work out. That's sometimes pretty much all you do. Work, sometimes, sometimes those workouts feel, felt like like almost more pressure and more than than the games do now for me. Oh, at least. one like, one one thousand percent, one thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. We talked about it before when we saw each other. Like it's just, it's almost like it's just like a routine. You almost like you're not nervous. You're just like you're ready. You just know you're ready, and you're just like. It's, I've been here how many times now for your fourth year going into fifth, whatever, my third going into fourth. Like, it's almost starting to feel like, oh, damn, we, okay, this is job. We're at work. We do our job. There it is. We go home. <laughs> right. It's, cra it's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Actually, that's really good input from, you know, you guys who've been in it. You know, take me a little bit through that first season. Or, you know, what were the challenges going into a rookie year in the NFL? I'm, I'm sure the adjustment protection wise uh, can be tough. But, you know, what were each of your guys' challenges going in your first NFL season? You know, I thought for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously I feel like I'm undersized for a long snapper. Um, so I felt like I was definitely going to get tested in protection, especially as a rookie, which rightfully so, like, if you're a rookie long snapper, you're going to get tested, you know, at least early on in the year. And, you know, I felt like just kind of accepting that and, 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 you know, learning about like what it feels like in there to actually get rushed and like get schemed on and like kind of recognizing the rushes. Like that was kind of probably my biggest learning curve. Um, I really wasn't even worried about throwing a ball at that point. Like that the snap is second nature. It's, it's after that what i think i feel like is learning curve okay yeah definitely definitely the learning curve is like there's snappers who can go and they can snap really good in the field you know snapping with their buddies but when you're going you have some dude that's like trying to run through your face and like just they're trying to make your day real bad for you right and you gotta kind of pull your pants up and say all right let's go you know 
and even as a rookie, it doesn't matter. Like the NFL, they expect production day one. It doesn't really matter. Like you have to throw a good snap and then you have to protect. And like, it's the, the, the job description is easy, but actually getting those little bullet points are a little more difficult than what they seem like. Um, for me, it was like mentally just like preparing myself, being able to like get in a zone where I'm not going to like get so pumped up that I throw the ball super hard and high or, you know, I'm, it's controlled chaos. The game of football is controlled chaos. And I really had to control it to where it wasn't a level of chaos. And you get almost in like a zen state because it's very similar. The snap is very similar to golfing. Like you don't really feel like you're snapping the ball. You kind of just, you just go with it. And then after that, then you kind of have to flip the switch and it's like, all right, I got to be athletic and I got to kind of have a little edge to you to, to hold your own out there because the realization is like, everyone's going to be bigger, faster, and stronger than you. And if you're one or two of those things, like they have one thing on you, you know, you're not ever going to have all three. If you're lucky to have two, they still got one on you. So they, and they're, people are freaks. Like even people on punt return are freaks. Like mm, everybody's yes. freaks. So you have to like be able to deal with that. Like I had, <laughs> um, like this year I went against a couple of first round draft picks this year. Like you just really, it's like, okay, let's get it. Like you just gotta, you can't have a mentality of, oh, crap, look at who it is. Like, at the end of the day, it's nameless and faceless. They all put their shoulder pads on at the same time. So, like, one, once I, uh, one thing I want to bring up is just, uh, you know, I was able to watch uh, both Christian and Jacob's first games ever as NFL long snappers. Uh, and I remember there's a big difference from watching a rookie uh, to watching them as they are now. Um, and one of the biggest things that's visual is, like, the speed of the game and how they react to it. So, uh, I remember watching one of Jacob's first snaps, snapping and blocking, and he did a great job, but you could just tell he was excited and just ready to just go anywhere and everywhere and run and pass the returner a little bit. Um, I remember having to talk after the game about maybe breaking down or um, slowing the game down, but now, you know, you can watch both these guys and, and watch how they look a lot more calm, cool, and collected with just approaching the game and uh, making sure that they're slowing the game down for themselves. Um, and being more aware of the situation. So I think the more experience you have in those uh, scenarios and situations, the easier it gets. So obviously that's paying off now, but um, that's something as a rookie, you don't really get, you just get thrown in there. Uh, the guys are bigger, faster, stronger. Like they said, the scenarios might be new. Uh, and it, I think it takes a lot for these guys to just, uh, you know, hit the books and, and watch film and make sure that they're prepared for those situations as well. Yeah. And kind of like what you said, Kyle, or speaking to that point, like if it's predictable, it's preventable, right? And like learning what what to prevent or what to predict, what you've been struggling with, and then actually seeing it, I'm sure goes a long way for you guys. What about you, uh, Christian? When you met, talk about a little bit when you met Kyle and and kind of your process into the getting acquainted in the NFL. Yeah, so I think um, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I. I when I, I signed with New England as a linebacker, I think in 17, I got I cut very, learned very quickly, got cut very quickly after a day. Um, and I think right after that, we, we, my agent, Ryan, who I think he was the one who was like, listen, we should reach out to Kyle, special teams, you, um, and start doing virtual lessons. And I think that's what we started doing back in 17. I think we started doing some virtual lessons and then it's, it's been a long time. I feel like you were here right on college, like in person. And then I think we might've done virtual for a little bit either way. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah, it was, I was, I was, I was, I did come out. It was out. Yeah. I don't know, but it was a long time. It was, it was a long time ago right. regardless, but um, I don't know. Then I came out, went back did virtual. I've been up a couple of times since. Yep. I mean, we just, I don't know. We, we've, we've, I feel like we just learned what works for me and we just kind of build on it. And like the stuff that Kyle gives me and that I've learned, um, you know, I use that every day sometimes in the facility, you know, I'm working on my warm up routine and stuff. And just when like you think your technique's slipping, if you know, you feel like you haven't snapped as well as you wanted to, like just a couple of things to, you know, either get your lats loose and like make sure your body's feeling as good as it possibly can, or um, just doing some finishing, you know, drills with your hands to make sure you're throwing a tight spiral on a shorty day, um, just stuff like that. But yeah, we've, we've been, we've been at it for a minute now. He 
seen me at my worst. So, well, I think what's funny too is you and Jacob both have similar uh, deficiencies. Uh, do you guys? I don't know if you guys think you have this similar deficiency, but you would you uh, want to say what it is? Maybe like what it, when we were working, what is like the biggest thing we always focus on? I want to be on my toes more. I I hate that I slide and and like sometimes end up on my heels and I'm a little off balance. So, so a little more body control. Um, for sure, I think for sure. Jacob, uh, kind of a, a little similar issue. I think what it stems from though, is your backgrounds in playing linebacker, your aggressiveness, your, your want to just be, yeah, I want to go throw the ball hard and grip it harder. And so the biggest thing that I work on with both these guys, every offseason is being smooth and controlled. And I think if the more they can just harp on that, the easier life becomes. So, um, like they, we, we've all worked on the technique, the grip, the stance, the movement, everything like that. I think they all have a, a good understanding of that, but it's very easy throughout the season to be told block faster, snap faster, go quicker and kind of get back into your shell of like, well, I can just fix that with effort um, instead of fixing it with smoothness or technique or, or just calming everything down. So it's just kind of a funny thing that both you guys coming from the same background have that same issue. And I see that across the board with all linebackers, unfortunately, because in, as a linebacker, you can fix things with effort. You can run harder. You can hit harder. You yeah. can go faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely, that is definitely one of my. <laughs> smooth is smooth, yeah, smooth yeah, yeah. fast. That's what Not I'm to expose smooth your weaknesses. Oh, uh, hey, they're, it, it, it's on film now. If they're, if they're not, <laughs> yeah, they say, just turn on I'm film. At, yeah, I'm done at this point. They're already trying to get them. But that's all something you guys can control. That's all like between the ears. That's something that you yeah, guys sure. understand and know what to work on. It's just something that it's, it pops up for everybody. And even if you've worked on it and you've smoothed it out, it comes back to the front. It's, it's something that needs constant attention, um, especially because Agreed. You know, every, every coach wants you to block faster, get your head up quicker, or um, yeah. snap a faster ball. And, and most people's reaction to that is, well, I'm going to grip it harder, snap it faster, whip my head up quicker. Um, mm -hmm. And not thinking the technique, but just thinking the effort portion of that. Yeah. I think that's super valuable. And definitely, you know, even our specialists or young specialists, you know, they always think, well, yeah, once I make it to the NFL, I'll be done, you know, getting in. No, uh, it yeah. never stops, right? The, the hardest part about the NFL is staying in the NFL. It's not getting there. That is hard, but staying in it is the hardest part. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. So, hey, take a little bit, and since we're kind of in this offseason, Jake, Christian, you know, what is your offseason like? I'm sure after, you know, you guys have just finished the season, it kind of, uh, you take some time off. But what is your offseason kind of workouts like? Or, or what do you do when you start picking things back up? Um, so, like, right now, like, since probably I took the, the week after the end of the season off, I didn't do anything. And then I got bored on Sunday and worked out. And then Monday I was in our weight room and then I would just do like hypertrophy stuff, like kind of just get in a weightlifting shape again. Um, and I've been doing that since. And then like now I'm like any centric work. And then so a lot of, I like to, I mean, I just like to run around and stuff. It's kind of fun. It's a fun part of the training. So I would do stuff like that kind of whenever I felt like it, but just work out as hard as I want or not work out too hard. Like you could, because in season you have to do the lifts that, or requires mandatory so when you kind of do whatever you want it's kind of nice um so you can kind of be a meathead if you want to be a meathead you can be lazy if you want to be lazy i personally like in our position i don't think you can do that because then you really get caught slacking um but right now like i haven't snapped the ball since season um but like i've grabbed one and like thrown around over my head a couple times but other than that like i don't plan on touching one for at least another week or two similar with the same you know trading regimen i didn't really do anything like absolutely nothing after the season ended for a week and then got into like higher reps cardio on the elliptical uh, or an incline walk um higher higher rep lifts i mean um just kind of building your body back up and now i'm into the eccentric stuff um kind of into a program i haven't snapped yet probably gonna snap and I would say two weeks is going to give, give myself like the end of February. I was going to start, start back up probably two days a week, two, three days a week, do some drills, not full snaps at all, probably 10 yards, 12 yards and work some drills and 
And that's probably about it for the first like month that I'll snap is 10, 12 yards and drill work. Yeah. That's huge. What, and what, what do you like to do when you're getting back into it here? You're talking March and April, like what are some, you know, light or some drill stuff that you like to do? Um, I like working in the net. I don't know. A lot of, a lot of guys are, I feel like against working in the net, but I like just getting in the net, getting the camera out, filming ourselves. Um, you know, like our technique from the side, just making sure you're getting our crunch and, you know, I'll send pictures to Kyle and trying to work on a date to get up there to see him so we can normally we get it. We get a session in after the season and then I come back and work and he's just like a soundboard. You send him pictures, send him video. And he's like, all right, crunch more, do this. Um, but I, don't know, I just like getting in the net and filming and, and picking it apart and sending it and hearing what he has to say and then just keep working that motion. Yeah, that's I a... second that as well. I'm a big net guy, and like, I have to film everything. Like every snap mm -hmm. I can possibly do is film. Like I'm like yeah. OCD about it almost. Which is cool to hear because I think a lot of the kids that are going to listen to this um, maybe don't even use a net to snap with. They probably just snap to a punter or their dad or somebody full snaps um, and just try to make it happen. You know, if they can throw it, yeah, they must be doing a great job, right? So. Um, I think that's one thing that I, I want to, I want these guys to know is that it's it's important to take a break from full snaps and break it down and have a, a, a time away from performance mode to work on perfecting your process and rather than just seeking out a good or decent product. Um, so I think you guys both do a good job of that. And absolutely, we, we work every off season to get these guys back in shape and back on, on top and reanalyzing what they we're working on previously or maybe something that popped up new um and i think christian just comes up because he's got a favorite restaurant up here too but um uh, all the waitresses <laughs> love him there but uh, that might be the main thing but we also do some work while he's here too hey what, yeah. what by the way what restaurant is that because we may have the same one uh it's different so we all let oh, you guys talk because you, you both have your favorite spots yeah my what's my diner called again the um the uh, Altoona Family the, Restaurant. The Altoona Family Restaurant is my favorite diner. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Describe it, because I may have been there. I just don't know what it is um, exactly. Um, let me think. It's like it's like a log. It almost looks like a. I think like it looks like a log cabin house, like a green green roof. Um, not like like a dark green roof. <laughs> okay, it's, yeah, it's I haven't been there. Type. I haven't been there. No, so, Jacob. It, next time I'm up there, I'm gonna go. No, Every it's time the, uh, like, no, one, yeah, that's a breakfast one. And then the, the Mexican restaurant, they just opened up a new one. We, uh, Christian uh, and I ate there together when we were up there yeah. training together last year. It's good stuff. We got good that Mexican food. Good. Yeah, which yeah, you, you wouldn't think, but yes, it, that is true. Yeah, Christian told me yeah. last time he was in the, in Altoona family restaurant that all, all the old waitresses had to take photos with him because they found out he was an NFL player. I swear to God, I swear to God. <laughs> Big with the 60 were, plus uh, group. Yes. Yeah, they were shocked. It was funny. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, that's, that brings me to another point, not about 60-year-old uh, waitresses, but <laughs> snapping. Uh, when you guys talked about snapping in that, are you putting a target up? Or are you, you know, what's the yardage? What's the distance? How do you guys work that? I don't have – I have the net in the facility that's, like, layered, three-layered. I don't know which one it is. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Pitts, but it just sits in there, and that's the one I use because that's – I train here in Pittsburgh. But um, normally I'm just aiming at – I don't, like, put up a specific small, like, target or, or a ball on a tee like we do for the smaller tosses. Um, I kind of – I'm more, more so working, like, the motion of my – the mechanics of my body and not so much like the accuracy the, that that net's there just for a psychological like i feel like tool for us to use like all right we got to hit that target which is second nature to us like but we're working on our body mechanics you know um i won't go more than 12 yards when i'm snapping into a net just because you know punters move around back there they catch balls differently that make them look you know a lot better than if you saw a ball at 15 yards go into a net, you'd probably be like, oh, that looked weird. Whereas opposed if a punter was catching it, like he can make it look a lot better or a lot smoother. So 
um, 12 yards max and body mechanics for my drills. I get that. And that makes sense too, Kyle, like even when you talk about, you know, getting or falling in love with the process and you too, Christian, it's like, uh, you know, that's the same thing with when coaching special kickers and punters, it's like, Hey, make sure you get really involved over the process and not the result. You know, so many guys want to see in the off season yeah. hit these 65 yard balls. And it's like, let's get back to 35, 38 down the middle. And let's see a good rotational ball. Yep. hundred percent. And then, uh, okay. So that's really cool. And then you guys both talked about eccentric movements, Jake, what does that look like to you or what, what are, you know, eccentric movements? Can you explain that to us? So basically it's like just the lengthening of the muscle in a certain movement. Like, so like bench eccentric is on the way down and then concentric is the opposition of that. It's on the way up. Um, and so pretty much like you just are building basically muscle viability. You're making it stronger. You're, you're putting, you know, some hypertrophy in there, your micro tears or whatever. And then you're just strengthening it. It's, it's really helps with like your tenants and ligaments. Um, it, it's like your injury prevention in season starts, you know, in the off season and what you do in the off season. And most programs usually start that way, like pretty much universally. Um, and if they don't, I, I hope they should, they change it because it's, I think it's great in my opinion. And science also says that, um, but, um, so like on squats, like you do four sets of five, three seconds down with like 60 to 75% of your max or estimated max. Same thing with bench. You might do some other accessory work, like single leg RDL, like is what we did today with like a three second eccentric, do that, you know, three by five, um, like a RP, RPE rate of pursuit effort of like six to eight. Um, you know, just every, basically it's a normal workout, normal basic programming, but just with going slow on the way down, essentially. Gotcha. Yeah. So slow on the way down, then exploding up. So for exactly. all you snappers listening in, notice that these guys are meatheads and it doesn't hurt to be a little bit uh, aware of how you train and what you train. So I think that's helpful too. It's huge. Stuff I and, and liking the weight room, I mean, the weight room is your best friend. Like alignment, like on our, like on our team, they're a little bit older. Like I wish I really enjoyed, I, later, like I wish I took advantage of the weight room even more than like just for a required lift. Cause like I would do, it's not a big lift. It'd be like two sets of like eight reps, like super light stuff, just moving it fast. Like I felt I, to me, I mean, and it's a common thing is like motion is the best lotion for your body. Like it, it just keeps you loose and keeps everything going. So I'd like take advantage of having an open weight room all the time and just like either after or after practice usually when I do it and it just helps a lot to be a meathead, but in a smart way. Sure. And Jake, you seem very on that meathead train. What are some explosive lifts that you enjoy doing or, or, you know, what do you think has helped? Cause even Christian was saying you would snap a fastball, you know, what has really helped your, your snap speed or what do you like to do with that? Um, power cleans are probably like, I've always been really good at power cleans, um, comparative to like my other lifts. Um, uh, but just like, I mean, having strong, having strong lats, I think help having just healthy shoulders and being able like, I think Kyle and I talked about the length of, uh, your lat, like it'd be cool to look at, see who snaps fastballs to see like, if that has anything of it, just anatomy wise. Yeah. But I think having lats is an important thing and, having a strong core, obviously, because that's where your snap starts from. Um, and just, like, I think it stems from throwing in high school, um, like shot put and stuff, because you have to be twitchy in that. And it's just, like, everything just kind of goes together. Um, I don't know, and I think I'm just kind of luck. Like, I just happen to throw a fastball, and it's like you just get lucky sometimes. One thing that we see a lot in the offseason, too, is when we, uh, we're looking at – the radar when Jacob's snapping, usually the first couple snaps we take is uh, good, but maybe a little bit slower. And then once we're able to lengthen him out a little bit more too, he usually snaps a faster ball. And I think the same thing goes for Christian and most snappers that come here. Um, so technique, the sequencing, um, creating a block, transferring energy better. Uh, I think this last off season, Jacob, uh, one of your first snaps that we radared was probably like 35 miles per hour and everything was hitting at the same time. And once we're able to create your better block, I think you're getting 36, 37s again. Um, so once again, it comes down to 
it does help to be strong. It does help to be twitchy. It does help to be an athlete. Um, using your, your body like a, uh, a pitcher or thrower would, keeping your shoulders and lats healthy is important. Um, but also the technique in which you do it, which I think a lot of younger snappers mix up and get backwards as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge. And Kyle, you're so good at explaining that stuff and in, in, in teaching from a standpoint of like body movement, functional body movement, and not just, hey, here's the technique, just snap the ball. Right. So. Well, that's that stems from nobody could ever tell me what, why, or how. They would tell me to snap it faster or block faster, do it better. Um, so I was always starved for that information. I want to be able to help these guys out understand why they should be doing something different and how it should look and what it should feel like. Sure. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about another muscle. Okay. The brain, uh, you know, when you're handling, cause of course you guys, no matter how many games you've been in, you're still going to deal with nerves every game. And, you know, especially for these young guys, you know, that are trying to make it here, you know, Christian, how do you handle the nerves of a situation? Do you have a mental cue that you tell yourself? What's that process look like for you? Um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds cliche, but never get too you know, high on the highs and low on the lows. Like we're human. It's not going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Um, so like, especially in the game, like, yeah, after the game, I'm going to be pissed off. Like if I know I played bad, um, and, and probably wear it on my sleeve a little too long and I should, and, you know, Heather's laughing right now because I've ruined, you know, days because I was pissed off about how I played, but in the game, like you don't have time to be pissed off. And if you do, then like you're, you're going to screw yourself for the next rep. So like in the game, you just got to accept the fact it's not going to be perfect and you got to get out of the game, you know, as clean as you can. Um, and that's kind of it. I mean, yeah, it's, it's frustrating, but it, you got to learn to let it go. Yeah, it's good. Let it go. You have a saying do you, that you tell yourself, Christian. If you got a bad ball, you just tell yourself let it go, like you're in Frozen. Um, I don't really. I've probably used too many too many curse words. I can't say <laughs> it on the on the air right now. <laughs> what I usually say to myself, but yeah, there's some self talk in there for sure. Yeah, maybe letting it out, clearing it out, and then moving on to the next one, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think one thing that's important for these guys too is, uh, you know, every off season to, to make sure they're chasing perfection so they can reach greatness and knowing that in, when you're in that situation in that game, you're not a robot, you can't be perfect. So allowing themselves to have mistakes, but understanding why they had a mistake and what they can do to correct those mistakes is really important. So it's very important to have a, a good attitude approaching the game, you know, don't try to be a perfectionist in a game, be a perfectionist in your drills and in your practice. So um, all of the best long snappers that I've ever worked with or been around are the, the most chill guys on game day. Um, they're relaxed, they have fun, um, and they're not too high, uh, you know, in those situations, you know, they're not too high strung. Um, on the other hand, you, you can see a snapper who is maybe a little more high strung and, and aware of the situation and the importance of the situation. You can even just see it in their eyes or how they talk. Uh, you know that they're worried or they're anxious. So even just like how you compose yourself on the outside can translate to how you feel on the inside as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's valuable. That's valid. Jake, what do you think about that? Um, it's kind of going off with Kyle. So I think your composure in the game, like as a snapper, like even if you are a little nervous, like you're like, Oh damn, this team is a good rush team or whatever. You got to look at it as like a challenge because at the end of the day, like practice is usually way harder and, and you know, in the week, then the game will be. Um, so you just got to understand that you are ready. And like, you just kind of got to, you know, just say, all right, let's go. Let's get it. You know, like it's, it's going to be fun. And I think one thing that helps is like trusting the people around you because you are a unit. You do have guards that help you and staff for you and communicate with you. And I think trusting your guards helps a lot and having good guards is, is an important thing for a snapper of the NFL. Um, and I yes. think just trusting yourself, like just, you know, you may have your own highlight tape that you watch or whatever. Like, it sounds kind of egotistical, but it's not. It's just like putting good, you know, thoughts and things in your mind that allow you to kind of achieve that, like, mindset of, like, all right, let's get it. Like, I am good. I am. Like, I got this. Like, you know, like, um, and, like, kind of keeping your push on the outside. Like, because everyone you talk to, the coordinator cross. Like, if coordinator sees you kind of, like, shit in your pants a little bit, they're going to be like, all right, we're going after this guy. Like, we're going to try. And I know what some coordinators do. Like, my thing is, I know in the leagues, like, 
first ball he's amped up, he's going to let her rip, you know, and you may get be able to show a rush look and he may throw it high, you know, kind of mess up the op and maybe get one. So I'm like, I take that personally. You have to take things personally. Like it is what it is. Um, because that's product. You got to take your product personally. Um, but so I really worked on that this year and I thought I got way better at that. Um, but uh, so like your composure and it helps with, you know, your punter and your kicker because they can be nervous too. You can see it in sometimes the other team and or, you know, your players or whatever. And I think it, you being calm helps them being calm um, a lot and kind of gives them trust in you. Um, that's one last thing that they have to worry about. Um, and I think just understanding the game, like you just have to simplify it in your mind. Because at the end of the day, there's all these rushes and looks that you can get a 33 double stack, you know, a load or whatever. But at the end of the day, you're either getting a straight rush or you're getting a cross face. And that's all you're going to get, whether it's a kick twist. It's still a cross face is the way you defeat it. And a straight rush is still there. And that's when having like, a, you know, good guards that stab for you and, and don't jump out or whatever, that helps you a lot to where you can just focus on the snap and then not have to worry about getting up too quick where you do throw a bad ball or, or whatnot. So I think just create, you know, kind of, having a good environment you know creating your own good environment and having trust in the people around you really helps a lot there's no question there's no question and i will say too jake that to your point like being a kicker or punter there were times where i'm up you know hyped up and i i do think that uh our snapper that was like his job almost like keep the spe other specialists level like they you're right and just like you said kyle good snappers always have a very calm you know never too high never too low personality um and that definitely calms them down and i will say i had a question too i reached out to a few of my coaching buddies uh and one of the questions i got back was you know what's that communication with your guards like have you ever had a time where you had to you know get after them or how do you how do you handle that obviously them being position players and and uh you know you being a long snapper what's that communication like sometimes like if they're playing like say some, you know because usually the your guards are, are are not starters. Sometimes you are. Last year I had a starting linebacker as my guard and he was phenomenal. Um, but like sometimes they can check out because they're worried about the play that they're about to play on defense or whatever. They're focused on that. But most of the time, I mean, it's the NFL. Everybody's good and everybody like comes in lock in. Like you in college, I think you could expect that. But in the NFL, like thankfully everyone's pretty locked in. But like sometimes they just may not see it. They get they get got to or whatever you you know, they get beat too. So they're worrying about they still have their own world to worry about. Um, but like at the end of the day, they know if like they just stab and go straight back, even if they miss a call or whatever, they're gonna it's gonna be all right. Um, but you, I don't think because there's a respect to the game, you can't go in there and like chew their ass, even if you are your 10th year in the league or a rookie or whatever. I don't, I don't, you can't really do that because like they are NFL linebackers, like you know, there's their respect to it, and they they just you know made a mistake, uh, which everybody does. Um, I think you should be, hey, man, you got to give me that call. Like, did you see that guy? Like, kind of just talk about it, show him on on um, film or whatever. But to be honest, I've been blessed to have really good guards my whole career. So, like, I haven't had to do that too much. But um, that, like, maybe I had to do it a couple times. So, like, especially the younger guys, like when you go into OTAs or training camp and you're doing a joint practice and you see, like, some rookies come in as, as your guards, you're kind of like, oh, okay, like, let's, all right. You know, you, you, that, it does make you a little bit nervous, in my opinion. Um, but it is also cool to see those dudes grow up and kind of not, you know, when they do mess up, because they are going to mess up. But it's cool to see them not mess up and, you know, develop as players. It's kind of a side story. But um, but I think you just kind of just tell them straight up, like, hey, did you see that? Because that happened. So, like, we got to get that figured out. Yeah. Christian, do you remember a time where you've had a – a tough look or had to have a tough conversation with, you know, one of your guards um, and how, how'd that go? Uh, I don't think there's like, like kind of like Jake said, there's not really like tough conversation. It's, they know, you know, they have a job as well. And, you know, they're, everyone's out there, you know, trying to do, obviously, you know, they want to keep their job and, and they know how hard our job is to so like, they have a little appreciation for it as well like they know they get stabbing get vertical like everything you know trust their technique their pros um i mean there's been a time or two where guards just kind of communicate with you you know 
kind of pre-snap when your head's down, like you got to make sure you have some sort of communication with them. Like if you get out there, which I have, you know, it's happened to me before you get out there with a new guard and like, he's not talking to you about, you know, movement guys or like anything that's going on out there or tapping you or letting you know. Um, and like, you're kind of left out on an Island and that's a scary thing as a snapper to be kind of, you know, left out on an Island by yourself. Like we're supposed to have people around us. So, um, but yeah, it's a communication thing, and, and and these guys are pros, so like it's it's just different. Like in college, yeah, you'd expect a guy to like have a men aware, but like this is what these guys do, and, and they take it very seriously. So, question and Cal, so what do you you know what is you guys kind of hit on it, but what is what is a tough look that you can get? What is the toughest thing that you need to practice in the off season so that you know, when season comes around, you're not worried from a protection aspect. So it really comes down to only a couple of different looks, right? Like Jacob hit on the head uh, earlier. Um, you can get a bunch of different looks uh, scheme wise, but they're really only going to do a couple of things, whether that's a straight rush, a cross face, they might bull rush you. Um, so I guess, what do you guys feel like is one of the toughest things for you to pick up? Is it a straight rush? Is it a bull rush? Is, is it a cross face? I I think it depends who the rusher is, like how yeah. how, how how the Very team's subjective. rushing. Um, yeah, I, I feel like they're all every rush is tough. Like I mean, every every yeah. snap's tough. Let's not let's be real. So it's like whoever's in there rushing you and how they scheme you is what's the hardest rush at that point. They're all they're all pretty damn hard. <laughs> I I'd agree with that. Like they like kind of going back, to like saying everybody's freaks. Like not yeah. You know, snappers are, you know, can be athletic, but they're not the freaks that are playing, you know, and, you know, just out there being freaks. Um, so, like, and we got to block those guys usually because if they're not playing on defense, they're going to be on the roster and they're like, all right, go rush a punt, you know, whether it's like, you got to look at it like D linemen, like they're probably the hardest because they're like outside backers because they're big, fast and strong. So they, you know, they're that, you know, which is what most people use. Um, yeah, which terrible. you know, everyone knows they're the hardest because they're powerful enough to run through, you know, an arm block or whatever, or they're and they're quick enough off the ball. That's what they do for a living is rush the passer. So they're quick off the ball. Um, and they're just freaks. Um, so you kind of just, yeah, you kind of, yeah, you just, there's little things inside the game that you can do to help yourself out, but a lot of it is just you can't in my opinion you can't predict what the rush is like i think there's teams that do do the same yes. thing over and over again but there's that one time where you think they're going to rush straight and they cross face and you set a little too hard or you think you're going to cross face and you don't set hard enough to the right and they can go right past you um so you got to really just be reactive like you can watch film and understand what they do i think you, film to me is more understanding who they're rushing and when they're going to rush yeah uh, and then kind of just have an understanding of what they're going to attack and it's it everybody knows that they're going to attack the gaps because it's the quickest and easiest to get or the slots you know like an up and under on a slot yeah. um outside of that like the gaps attacking the weakest link on the team is in protection is probably the snapper so it's like the easiest to go in the a gaps yeah there's no question that's yeah well and then so you know you guys kind of talked about the film study aspect you know when you get to that point or when you get to mid-season Jake, what are you watching when it comes to film study? You know, what do you focus on when you're watching film? Like, I guess the coordinators, uh, like, mentality, like, do they have a good returner? Like, if they do, they're pr pretty much going to – they're predominantly going to be a return team. Like, if it's fourth and three and below or fourth and five and below, and you're around midfield, they're going to either – they're probably going to either – rush typically they don't because they don't want the false start or the, the encroachment or they're gonna have b stay out there you gotta look at who if the d lineman like they do uh, they try or do they just yeah, like, yeah just fill the hole and like you know just go off the field that's, that's um, the best it is but then you get a guy like christian wilkins from oh. Dolph the dolphins who's like He's a terrorist on film for snappers perspective. And like, he just runs for no reason. Like it, it's hilarious, but I'm, you know, we played them this year and I'm glad he didn't do it to me, but Dude, I'm sure the time Jeff, will come. That's so. how Jeffrey Simmons, Jeffrey Simmons is like that for Tennessee. He's like a big bully. Like he just wants yeah. to just kill you out there. It's yeah. terrible. If I were them, I would do the same thing. Cause like you can yeah, do it. Like, Might as well take advantage he, of it. Yeah. These guys hit me with a, Yeah. They're huge. 
What about, um, from a technique perspective too, what are you watching? Um, as far as snapping technique, uh, just like really, if the ball's consistent and good, and like, I mean, it's kind of that part's easy, but like my finish, like, and do I finish before I try to get up? Like my footwork, am I, am I setting the way I want to set? Is my footwork good? Like when I like how reactive I am to what I see, like, are my feet moving, you know, um, am I able to plant, um, kind of just how are, like, I kind of, when I see a team say they rush a certain way, I go back and look at clips from, you know, those same rushes I've got before and like how I do against them or like what I did really like what, what the time where I did really good against them or what the time I did bad against them and kind of go from there and just to work on that. Um, so I have like a bag that I work on that's like been a staple in my, you know, season regimen and off season, um, that I will do certain reps of, with the rushes that I'm expecting, um, that they've shown on film, um, to kind of prepare myself for the week and then practice as well. Yeah. Yeah. Christian, what about you? Um, you know, Kind of just what uh, kind of off to what Jake said. Uh, I'm watching film more so. Like when you get into guessing rushes, is I feel like when you get into your most trouble, like you'll guess a rush and then you'll get pick twist and like you, a guy's behind you and you're trying to tackle him, like you know, like a fish. Um, but you know, I feel like watching film is more so gaining an understanding of what the coordinators are doing and, and like how the game, how they like playing the game. Like if a team's up. Our team's down. They like to rush. They like to set up a return. Who the returner is, um, different things like that. Not so much watching and like watching who's rushing on you and like which guys are going to be rushing in the A gap. Do they like to swim move? Do they like to, you know, they like to cross face this guy? Do they like to, um, you know, movement? What whatever it may be, like like you're watching film more so to gain an understanding of the flow of the game and not so much like we're going to get like that look and this is the rush because they could drop something totally different from that look. So you just have to trust your technique and block left, block right, or, you know, get wide in there and take up, you know, pick twists or whatever. Right. And that's kind of the, uh, the transgression of the progression from college, right? I don't know how much you guys watch film like that. I know coordinators, I know, you know, coaching at this level, that's what we watch is, you know, times when we might get a pressure look or a safe look but um you know is that one of the biggest jumps uh from college to nfl is you know what you watch on film what you pay attention to yeah probably i mean just i feel like a lot of other positions you know defense especially they can see a formation and recognize you know what the offense is kind of running based on that um but you know, for us, we're out there and, you know, a lot of stuff happens. It happens very fast too. like um, punt plays crazy. Like a lot of times it's not even on TV because we get out there, it gets set. And by the time the cameras get back, like we're gone and we're out. So, um, I mean, you catch people in, in positions and you get kind of get free reps in there. If people are running on the field, um, there's different like different tricks and, and stuff, you know, bobbing your head a little bit or moving different movements with your hand. Um, so all different, all different types of stuff that you can kind of pick up on watching film and try to get a guy to jump off sides by doing that. Um, stuff like that. But I try not to overwatch film. And then you're kind of. Losing. I'd agree to not overwatching film as well. Yes. I mean, that sounded like a lot, but like, in reality, you're just watching it all, thinking about all those things at once, and then you're like, okay, I'm done. Hmm. I know what they're going to do. Yeah, kind of get a general summary, right, and then put it away. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. What about you? Kyle, you got any input on that? What do you watch for, you know, when you're analyzing film? And actually, more so what I was going to hit on, Kyle, is what do you think the most important phase of the snap or, you know, what do you pay attention to? From a purely a you know a fundamental standpoint, uh, what are you looking at or paying attention to? Yeah, so what I'm going to watch for is, is different than what these are, guys are going to watch for. Um, so those guys are focused a lot on like what what are they going to see, what's coming up, and they're trusting their technique throughout the season. What I'm watching for more so is how is their technique holding up? Where are things slipping? Are they maintaining what they should be working on? Um, and so. 
that's why doing drills during the season is, is extremely important too, not to uh, continue to change or improve, but to make sure that they're not backsliding on what they have been focused on. So, you know, working on things that allow them to be smooth or balanced or efficient or controlled, um, you know, and just doing maybe like one or two days a week, a couple drills here and there uh, definitely can go a long way. But, you know, when they're watching film, it's more so like they've done the work, they can just go in and, and make it happen rather than studying their technique in the moment um, because they know that they're constantly working on that stuff too. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Well, that kind of leads me, Colin, to talking about, you know, weekly practice schedule. Okay, you're in season now, right? And you're coming off a game on Sunday. You know, what is, Jake, what's, what's kind of like your post game or your, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, What's a practice week like? What's a practice day like in depth for you? Um, so I would say so like this year I I snapped uh Wednesday and Friday were my two days and then I did like ten short snaps just to keep the laces going as for our kicker um on Wednesday. But on Tuesday, like I'd get there, do my little warm up, um, then do a couple of drills in my in my snapping warm up, and then I would um, I would snap to warm up. Then I go and start working with a with AJ or punter once he's ready. We probably he did a good job of having a snap count. I do like forty, sometimes fifty balls. I'd like my sweet spot's like around forty ish, give or take a couple. Um, but so I I'll do that, and then we'll probably get. 80% of those snaps already, you know, in the pre, in the pre punt period, then we'll go to our punt period and snap our, you know, our set eight, to 10 or whatever. And then we may come and do eight to 10 more after the period, but sometimes we could be finished. And usually we have a field goal period after that. And then we immediately move to a field goal and then snap field goals, five or six warm ups, And then I kind of have a thing where it's like, those ones are good. I don't need to snap anymore. I don't, I'm good. I can just grab the ball and snap it and it's going to be good. Like, I don't think I let my muscle memory and the tech, the technique I've practiced take over and kind of go from there. And then, you know, we have our field goal period, which I kind of like because it's like, it's not that you feel the pressure, but it's a different scenario of kind of what, than just grabbing the ball and snapping a field goal and a warm up or whatever, because there are people around you, there are people touching you, so you kind of have that um, that feel that I personally like for field goals. Um, and then it's basically identical to Friday. Obviously, Friday is not going to be as intense of a practice. Our punt, our pump practices on Wednesday are usually padded, so then like it's like full go. Like our coach likes to make it fun for us. Um, you know, they know the snap cadence, they know when we're snapping it. They line up on the ball, which you not, yeah, Christian, no. Um, it's, which obviously not going to be in a real game. So that was my point going back and saying, usually practice is harder in a game. So you've seen it before and you're ready for it. Um, but I like it because in the game, it's slow. Like it seems, almost, it's not easy by any means, but it's yeah. slower and you're able to react to it. Um, and then Friday, same thing, just with no pads. They're not, they're, it's only like two or three steps, quick steps, so you get the feel kind of just like to wrap everything up. It's like a final draft. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go to uh, then Monday, hit a lift in the morning. I like to watch the film immediately after the game. Like as soon as like the guy, the film guy comes around, I'm like, hey, right here, right here. I need the film. Let me, yeah. let me get it. Um, just because you're like, you just want to see how everything goes. And, like if you did do good, you can, you know, you want to see it. But if you did bad, you watch that first. And I'm like, I don't care if I could snap 10 balls and that they, if, nine of them are perfect and the bad one's bad i'm like all right what is this what is wrong with this battle I'm like what the hell happened um mm. you know it goes the same the same with like protections or anything like that or you know it is reward it's I, to me it's very rewarding it's like almost addicting when you work really hard in this in um the week and you do good in the game like you want to watch that because it's like makes it just exciting and kind of the game was in the game you really enjoy it um and same thing you know if you do do bad okay, what can I improve on? Because I don't want that feeling. Because it's when you throw a bad ball or you mess up on something, you're like, damn, like, it just sucks. So you don't want that feeling. Um, and you just immediately grasp to like, all right, what do I need to do? And I'm like, all right, Kyle, what happened on this? Like, if I just, you know, if I know, I usually can tell right when the ball leaves my hand if it was a good ball or not. So I'm either snapping it, you know, I can usually figure it out pretty easy. But if I'm like lost, I'm like, Kyle, what's going on? Like last year in OTAs, 
I was like, Kyle, I keep snapping a wobble and I've done everything and anything and I don't know what's going on. I went to him like, I think two times pretty consecutively. And then by the end of it, we had to figure it out. And I was like, okay, sweet. You know, and it was such a simple fix. I didn't even think about, um, but it, and then going back to it, it is nice to have a resource like Kyle that he, you've worked with him enough that you understand him, that he's like, all right, you know, this isn't this, this is your staple. It's your basis of your foundation of snapping. What are you doing different from that? You know, oh, oh well, it's a grip. Oh, well, it's a sequencing. Oh, well, you know, you're not, your weight isn't distributed properly. Like you're sliding your feet or you're light on your toes or, you know, you're just whatever the, you know, the subject is. But um, that's just, and it just, you do that for the 17 weeks. Yeah. Hopefully more. Yeah. And so, so like you're talking about there with Kyle, like comparing it to your best ball, right. And saying not, you know, what is, how does this look different or how is this, yeah, off from your, your good balls. Is that right. And that one thing I, I think I like to do even to one up that is like compare them to what perfection can look like. Here's what perfect can look like. And here's where you normally are. Let's keep pushing. So that way, if something does slip, like the grip or the body control or the efficiency that you have something specifically and deliberately to chase rather than just like trying to get to where you used to be um, always trying to push for better. Sure. Sure. Yeah. My, my other question too with that is, okay. So Wednesday you said, you know, when you're getting warmed up, you'll do a few drills. What do you like to do? What do you like to get started with at the start of practice? Um, I like to do the chop drill and then some sequencing stuff, like really just like, not even with the ball, just kind of focus on my crunch initiating the snap and then following through and finishing on my target. And then I kind of just ramp up the pace from there and then I'll grab a ball and throw like two or three balls like that. And then I'll just go into snapping, but kind of pick it up and like start slow and then pick it up by the time I'm doing full snaps. I'm like, all right, I feel full go. Everything feels the same. It's just a little bit quicker and, but it's still smooth and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As far as the chop, you know what, what is that like? Sorry, keep going. Um, no. so it's like, it's like one where the bags against the, the, or your cow's better at explaining it. So I'm, so I'm going to be careful about explaining it. Jacob and, uh, most snappers have something specifically that they're deficient on, which, you know, whether it's their sequencing or their balance with their hands or their finish. Um, one thing Jacob always works, works on is his sequencing. So chop drill is basically going to have him focusing more on pulling his core before swinging his hands down instead of just driving his elbows back or pulling everything at the same time. So it really breaks up his movement, just like a step before a throw allows him to create stretch, leverage, acceleration, um, and then control his body through a chopping movement that allows him to accelerate that ball. So like I said before, both these guys come from a linebacker background where being quick and fast and, and aggressive is normal or common. So anytime we can work on fluidity, lengthening the movement out, um, I think it'd be extremely helpful. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like I've seen that on your instagram kyle where you're taking like a half a half pad or something right and you're, yep. you're using your hands to kind of chop down gotcha yeah Love yeah it. a bunch of different variations but yeah that's the pretty standard version yeah yeah that's really good what about you christian do you is your schedule kind of look like that do you snap more than two days a week and you know what do you like to do uh when you snapped you know your total amount of balls yeah it's um, it's very similar, you know, Monday after a game, you want to get a lift in right away, Tuesday's off day, um, tubs, massage, Wednesday's your punt day, all punt, I don't snap any shorties that day, um, probably we have like anywhere from 15 to 18 reps in a period, and, and usually it's pads and it's a live rush, and kind of like what, what Bob said, like, you get better in those practices because it, it is harder. They know your rhythm. They know the snap count. They, they know what, you know, those guys are in the meetings too. They see who's getting beat and like where the deficiencies are. So, um, it is harder, but Thursday then is all short snaps, probably 10 reps of those in period. And, you know, I'll work on the side with the holder and probably get another, I like to get a lot of shorties on Thursday, probably another like 15 reps, 15 reps after the period, like just working different spots, we're running on, um, calling out where we're at, at. If it's, you know, especially when it's cold and we're practicing, like the ball gets dry. So like, I want to make sure I'm, you know, tacking up my hands the right way. And, 
you know, spotting the ball, letting it roll on the grass a little bit. And because, you know, that's more game like than, than, you know, getting a perfect ball, putting it on the ground and snapping it on turf, like snapping the dome. It's just different. So, and Friday's a, a mix of both field goal and punt days. Eight, eight punts, three field goal snaps. And that's really it. And I kind of keep it light, get a massage Friday. All throughout the week, I'm getting my lifts, but big massage guy. Big massage guy, two times a week, <laughs> twice a week. I mean, and then that's it. I mean, it's during the season, I feel like, you know, we, we work, we work, we work so hard in the off season. And during the season, it's like you're just trying to maintain where you're at. Like, don't, it's going to go like this, but as long as you stay steady, you know, get your routine, you'll be good. There's no question. Yeah. And, and having that routine, I think is important for a lot of guys or a lot of young guys that, you know, they haven't established that yet. What you, you talked about briefly though, but kind of, uh, you know, what, what, at the end of the practice, you know, are you, are you doing anything else? Are you doing anything without a ball or, you know, what do you like to do after you snapped your balls? Um, just stretch. I'm, I'm, you know, big stretch your lats, your hip flexors. I mean, if you don't have a hip routine, I got, I have a hip routine. Um, just to kind of open up my hips because you know we're bending down for a living. I mean, we're 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 in that position. Like if your hips start to get tighter, you feel off, you know, off just a little bit. That can alter your snap. So, um, for me, after I throw, like I like to stretch and hit the tubs. Um, and that's it. Like the latch stretch is huge. My shoulder mobility, shoulder mobility, hip mobility, you know, your lats, everything roll out. I mean, try to really take care of your body then hit the tubs and, and relax. Yeah. Those are kind of all the trigger points that most snappers struggle with too, is lats and shoulders, thoracic spine, hips. Um, and, and I think a lot of that can get neglected because guys just want to feel good. So they focus on what's sore instead of how to continue to prime their body. So, you know, I think both these guys do a good job of, of working their bodies and they understand their bodies. So awareness um, and knowledge on how to not only strengthen it, but to create mobility through there too, is really important as a snapper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That mobility. Yeah, body work is really important. Oh yeah. Jake, what I do you second do? that. Yeah. What do you like to do for body work? Do you have any hip routines or anything that you, you enjoy doing? Yeah, like I do like a glute like complex to warm up my hips, like with a band and then without a band. I get a massage twice a week as well. Um, I like to roll out a lot. I just like to, I mean, I don't mind. I like almost, yeah, I like to almost feel a little sore in my upper body. Yeah. Like, because usually I'll lift like Thursday is my last lift. Um, And like, you may be just a little sore on Sunday, but it's almost kind of nice because then when you warm up after it, that feels really good. But that's just a feel thing. Um, I'd say I like to stretch. I don't like to overstretch. I feel like personally I can overstretch, and I don't like it. I don't feel as twitchy. But I think having good mobility in your lifts throughout the season and understanding that is important to, like, just health in general. Um, And then, like, if something's bothering you, like, utilize your resources around your training staff, your athletic training staff. because, like, you can, like, because especially if you have a lot of time, unlike the other positions where they're in meetings, you may be only in meetings for 20 minutes. You may not meet at all. So, like, you can utilize that time, the extra time that you have to go in the training room and get, you know, body your body worked on by the people who are certified and are waiting around for you guys to come in there and for give them something to do, you know. One thing that I'll say is that watching both these guys come to my facility, they both have a, a pretty extensive warm-up routine where – I'll have guys come in and warm up. They're still warming up like 30 minutes into it sometimes. I'm like looking at my clock, wondering when we're going to actually start snapping. Because to be honest, I I really preach to young guys about warming up and doing it properly, but they don't know how, or they don't, they're not aware of their bodies enough to know that their bodies aren't prepared enough. So it's really cool to see these guys come in and, and have more awareness and and actually warm up properly. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something Tristan, that you, you know, hammer when you're, when you're, you know, going through that warm warm routine or Kyle, is there anything that you see that's uniquely different than, you know, the younger guys? I think the one thing that the biggest difference is they just do a a pretty intensive dynamic warm up. They move their bodies. Uh, Most guys will come in, they'll do a couple arm circles, then they'll throw. 
and then they think they're warming up for snapping. Whereas like these guys are moving on the ground, they're going back and forth up and down the turf. They get a little bit of, of a sweat going before they actually start to snap. Yeah. Um, and just, just like, you know, every other position on the field, these guys are athletes as well. They're using their whole body. They're trying to be as efficient as possible. So we got to make sure that they're uh, priming their body to perform the way they're expecting it to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You dynamic, yeah, dynamic warm up. I mean, I know I I hit the hurdles before every practice, whether I'm snapping short or long snaps, um, get the hips going up and overs, forward, backward, side. Um, and then dynamic warm up, just, you know, we got to move too, you know, just keep your body in motion. So I'm all about the dynamic warm up. I love it. Hit the hurdles. Mm-hmm. You, got to. you got to. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been awesome, guys. I really do appreciate, you know, the insight that you guys give. And, and you know, snappers can be obviously an overlooked position. I know, Kyle, you talk about going unnoticed, but uh, sometimes it's good to, uh, yeah, there you go. It's on the shirt. Sometimes it's good to it. acknowledge you guys. And I got a uh, a rapid fire section here presented by the Kicker's Bible. All right. Yeah, all right. Here we go, Christian. Looks like it's you, me, and Kyle. All right. For all right the rapid, let's hit it. Rapid fire section, okay? So both of you guys, you've had unique experiences being snappers, okay? Starting here with Christian, what is the loudest stadium you've ever been in? Arrowhead. Arrowhead. Kyle, what about you? Playing or, co- or attending? Yeah, uh, Whitewater. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not different level, but I love it. Still a different level of intensity. That's awesome. Okay. Absolutely. What, you know, Christian, what, you know, what was the experience like when things finally clicked or, or went your way? Did you have a breakthrough moment and could you tell us about it? Um, I don't know. I think, I think, you know, I, I don't think I, I got, I've been through a lot. So like that breakthrough moment, I feel like when I, it didn't even feel real. Um, it still really doesn't feel real to me if I'm, I'm being completely honest. I'm just kind of just working my tail off to stay in the league now, you know. Um, so I try to keep it as mellow as you can. You know, you can't, like I said earlier, you can't get too high on the highs and low on the lows. Um, you know, our jobs are one snap at a time. You, you know, these contracts or whatever don't mean anything like – you mess up, you mess up, you know, we're probably going to lose a job anyway, no matter what they're paying you. So we're on a one, one snap contract every time. That's a huge mindset. Kyle, kind of the, along the same vein, when did you realize like, Hey, I could really help someone with this and Hey, I'm really talented at what I do. So I have a background in physical education. And so like I've always been uh, interested in teaching and helping and, and discovering more ways to learn um, how to do things. But Coming from my background where I, nobody could ever tell me what, why, or how with snapping, I just have had that, that desire to be able to help guys. Um, and even though at the beginning of my career, looking back at it, I probably wasn't great at it, but I've continued to develop this and, and continue to work at it. And kind of, uh, I'm always experimenting and, and trying out new things just to continue to innovate the position. Um, but yeah, I think probably... I don't know if I can pinpoint it to exact time, but like as soon as I started getting guys that were like really all in on buying in on what I was telling them and, and utilizing it and, sh- and it, it pays off um, was about a time I, I started to really dive more into or start like believing in it more uh, myself. Yeah, that's huge. That's an awesome feeling. I know when you're coaching someone and they really believe in what you're teaching them. Awesome. Okay. Talk about Christian. What, what does it feel like? And this is a, a question from a young snapper here, uh, Mike, Mikey Munoz. Okay. You know, what does it feel like when you feel like you forgot how to snap or you're having an off day and how do you counteract that? Yeah. Uh, I think Jacob mentioned it earlier. Like it, it sounds, you know, a little corny, but wa- rewatching film where, you know, you had a good game or good snaps and, and strung together and like, you know, kind of reminding yourself like I'll go back and watch games from my, my rookie year when I'm sitting in a meeting or whatever and you know just remind myself like look at just you did this two years ago you thought you were you know you're definitely better than what you were two years ago you look at this last year look at this three years ago um it's like I like to watch film and remind myself and you know build my confidence back up that way you know reminding through film study like look how good I did right here look at this rep 
you know, that was a hard look and you dominated on that rep. So, you know, you could do it again. Absolutely. Watch and highlight yourself. Kyle, what do you tell guys that like, Hey, say, Hey Kyle, I, I have no clue. Like I, I don't, I do not feel like I can snap a good ball right now. Yeah. I think it all comes back down to the, the more, you know, the better you understand your craft, the easier it is to become a, a, an efficient snapper. So um, every time I'm working with somebody, I'm, I'm always asking them questions. How did you do that? What are you thinking about? Um, and digging into the details because um, you can't be confident in something you don't understand. And usually the guys that fall into those situations where they don't feel like they can snap a good ball and they don't uh, know how to bounce back from it. They usually just don't understand their fundamentals, which isn't necessarily a, a, a bad thing. It doesn't mean you're a bad snapper. It just means you're just not as polished as you could be yet. And there's always room to grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just understanding what you're doing helps and gives you an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Question for you again, Kyle, how do you spot talent in young snappers? Yeah. So uh, honestly, finding snappers is tough because you can't just go look at a roster and find a high school snapper. Usually they're playing a linebacker position or another position as well. Um, so, you know, just as far as like finding guys, that can be tough. Um, as far as like watching their talent though, I'm always looking for uh, their repeatability, their ability to um, uh, be efficient with their movement. And not every snapper is that, you know, ends up developing into a good snapper, but there's little tells with like um, how they're using their body, uh, if they're controlling their body well, um, and if they're doing things consistently, whether it goes down to their setup um, or even just how they're finishing their snap. Sure. That repeatability is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what do you think, Christian, best and worst? And I think this is always uh, interesting from a professional aspect, but the best and worst example you've seen of people handling failure in competition, in public settings, it could be in media or it could be with the team. What's the best and worst example of, of you know, someone doing that? Um, you know, I think the best example would be, you know, someone making a bad play and being able to bounce back and then, you know, help your team win after making that bad play. Like, that's a pro when, when you can really – you know, everyone knows you messed up and you get called out for it and you're on kind of the hot seat and you, you know, you bounce back and do your, your job. And I think that's kind of like the best example um, of, of being a pro and, and the worst, you know, in competition settings, I would say the, the worst is seeing a guy that does throw a bad ball or, or, or does something wrong that, that he wasn't, you know, self-approved of in, he kind of carries that on his shoulder and beats himself up about it and like lets it affect his next ball and kind of pouts about it. And you can tell by his body language and stuff that like he's already checked out. Um, I feel like that's like the worst example of, you know, in the competitive spirit, they, they don't want to see you react like that. No question. Yeah. Getting down on themselves and letting it beat themselves up for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What about Kyle? Question for you, for both of you guys. Actually, you had to pick a dream team of specialists. Okay, kicker. We're talking kicker, punter, snapper. Who's on your dream team, Kyle? I think there's a lot of really good, a lot of really good specialists out there, and, and they all bring a different thing to the table. So, uh, you know, when it comes to it, you know, we're always looking for, you know, in general, an athletic snapper, someone who's consistent, someone who carries himself um, very, very well mentally, and and just like their, their demeanor on the field is, is someone we're always looking for. Um, I think the same thing goes for kickers and punters too. Like how do they carry themselves goes a long way. Um, with those positions, obviously they have stats that you can look for, you know, sure. if we're, if we're going to pick a good kicker and punter, give me somebody with good numbers that we can track. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing really we can track for snappers besides like tackles maybe. Um, and just because you make a lot of tackles doesn't mean you're the best long snapper, you know? And I think that's just a stat that, um, it's just it's one of the only things they track for us. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I can respect that. Okay. Who's someone, I guess, in history, uh, you know, snapping wise, that is well respected by the snapping community. Like who are you guys you, you pin like, okay, these guys were the goats at what they do. I know for kickers, you know, uh, obviously Adam Vinatieri and having guys like David Akers that I've been able to connect with are clutch. Who is that for the snappers? And I feel like there's just, 
veteran guys that have been doing it. like Don Muehlbach who did it in Detroit for 20 years, LP in uh, Dallas for 20 years or 18 years. Um, Morgan Cox right now, John Weeks, those guys like that are getting up there in their 14th, 15th year. Like you just got nothing but respect to be doing it for that long, you know? So those are, I feel like my era um, guys, hopefully all of us, you know, behind, Kyle's wall can get up in that 15, 16 year range and put ourselves into that category. Oh yeah. It's be, putting, be putting Luke into there probably soon. I mean, if he keeps going like him, Bob as well. So just list a few. I mean, I probably miss guys too, Kyle. So I don't want right. to. Yeah. I mean, th- I mean, honestly, anybody that's like any of the older snappers that were pure snappers and paved the way are, are guys that should be looked up to um, technique it ranges from snappers to snappers, but it doesn't mean that they weren't good at what they did and they played a long time. So, yeah. uh, you know, just, I think a couple of guys that come to mind for me are Justin Snow uh, played a long time for the Colts. Patrick Manley is another good uh, example of that as well. He's got an award named after him now, obviously. So, yeah. um, you know, guys like that, I think are, you know, they were before us and, and kind of, even though they're unnoticed or unknown by the general public, like, you know, if you do any kind of research or you're in this community at all, you've probably heard some of those names before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool though. I, I think it's cool to have these people that, you know, are these players that have done it and have sustained, sustained success that you can look up to and say, Hey, these are the guys, you know? Um, all right. Last question here, wrapping up. What is, you know, one piece of advice you give for college long snappers? Kyle, we can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the biggest piece of advice I can give for any, college long snapper is to not be afraid to continue to improve yourself. Uh, I think a lot of snappers get into the the phase of their game where they're good enough. So they don't try to work on anything um, or they don't try to uh, better themselves. And sometimes that can be fine. You know, you can go your whole career, just doing what you've done and be fine. However, uh, you know, there are instances where if you do struggle, you have a bad snap, you don't know what caused it things can uh, spiral a little bit out of control there. So I'm a really big advocate for making sure that these guys are not only understanding their craft, but continuing to better themselves um, all year round, you know, so hitting the off season, chasing perfection, making sure that they understand those details as much as possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, would, I mean, I got to piggyback off that. Just, um, you know, never thinking you're good at, you, you know, you've hit a point where like, Oh, I've, I throw the best ball I could ever throw right now. You can always get better. Um, it's like a golf swing. You know, we compared it to golf. Every every snap's different. Like every form, every way you throw balls, every time is going to be different. So there's always going to be something where you can work and fix on. And um, you, can, you just can't be lazy with that if you want to be great. And um, that's kind of what I would leave with a guy that wants to, you know, keep pursuing this and possibly do it for a career later down the road. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. There's a big difference between tinkering and and doing something with a purpose. And I think that's what I think a lot of guys get hung up on is, well, I don't want to keep messing with my snap. Uh, you're yeah. not messing with your snap if you have uh, intent and purpose behind it. So, uh, but yeah, that's just a, one of the biggest things I see for a lot of snappers in general. Well said. Yeah, that's huge. And that strive to keep improving, keep getting better. That goes a long way, making sure you're you're always improving. Uh, last question here, uh, you know we have a myth buster section. Okay. And I want to know from both of you guys, we can start with Christian biggest misconception or misunderstanding about snapping in the NFL Christian. What, what do you want the people to know? All right. That they think they know, they don't really know. You know, I think people think that long snappers in the NFL can't get hit anymore because they changed the rule that, you know, they line up over, they can't line up directly over you. They can still line up over you. If you run an illegal punt formation, which the Pittsburgh Steelers, we, well, we used to, but if they would move, if the PP would move his feet, we don't anymore this year, they changed the rule. But um, if the PP moves, you can illegally line up over a snapper. And also, even if they're not lining up over you, they're lining up right on your shoulder and they're trying to kill you. Like they're not, you, you're not, you're not not getting hit in there. There's no one on a football field that doesn't get hit. I promise you. The kicker will eventually get hit. The punter will eventually get hit. Yeah. Eventually. 
and we're in and we're and we're in the trenches like if you just watch the film from some of the like the tight angle film that i wish the public would get like they would see how physical it is and like what actually happens in that small space on a punt you know like it's it's people just have no idea about that yeah you guys are going through it too they need to understand yes. that yes <laughs> kyle what, what biggest misconception about your job and working with snappers it's not as easy as it looks I think that's something that a, a lot of people, uh, media fans, you know, they, they just throw back there. It can't be that hard. Um, you know, anybody can snap, but it takes a, a different kind of person to become great at it and become efficient at it. So um, with that being said, you know, just making sure people at least, you know, go try it out. Try it out for yourself. Go 15 yards, put your head between your legs and have the biggest person that you know try to run you over after you've done it. Uh, and then we, we can talk about it after there. I love it. I love that energy because that's the same thing, you know, with kickers, even uh, college game day and another Yenzer, uh, you know, Pat McAfee making people <laughs> kick 33 yard field goals or whatever PATs. Hilarious. Not <laughs> a single person has hit it, you know? So, um, yeah. Harder than it looks. Yeah. Way harder than it looks. All right, guys. Well, Hey, you got anything left to say or anything you want to plug Kyle? Is there anything you got going on that you want the people to know about? Yeah, so not at the moment. I guess right now we're uh, we're just gearing up to um, head over to Germany. I'm speaking at the uh, Europe's largest coaching convention here at the end of this month. Um, yeah, which is pretty cool experience. So we're going to spread Wait, the cool. long snapping love across the world um, and do a little bit of that. But otherwise, you know, I'm just busy kind of with private lessons and virtual training. This all all this off season, getting guys prepared for their next opportunities. Yeah, and where can they find you at? Where can the people find you? Specialteamsu.com at specialteamsu on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, all the good social media platforms are too. He's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Worldwide. Christian, what, what do you got going on? Anything you want to plug? No, nothing. That, I'm getting married this off season. That's a plug that we're, yeah. we're very excited. So but I just want to thank man. you. Th yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I appreciate it. I, I have one more thing I wanted to pitch. I, I have this really cool uh, Christian Coons pickleball paddle. Uh, oh, pitch that. Yeah. So I, I got this custom Christian Coons pickleball paddle. Christian, do you even play pickleball? Why did I buy this? Yeah, thing? of course I play. Well, because when I come up there, I'm going to whoop you. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> We're going to make that happen. But uh, uh, you might have to autograph for me so I can uh, maybe sell it down the road for $10 or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <I'm> not <laughs> Not at Altoona's Diner, I'm telling you. Not at the Altoona Family They're going to frame that thing. They will. <laughs> is that is that Christian? Are you making your own pickleball uh, paddles, or what's that? What's the deal with that? Yeah, those. I I had a company reach out, and um, they wanted to make that for me. So it was Impact Pickleball, and they made this. It's actually a really oh, sweet baby. paddle. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It's high cool. quality. Yeah, That's where can nice. people find that? They can find that in the uh, link in my bio. Okay. actually yeah okay. on my instagram page tell them to good go stuff. to your, yeah, you go to a good cause or something or i, yeah, I know i bought it for a reason to support goes, something. yeah it was going towards cystic fibrosis foundation okay. at the time and now it's going towards uh, my foundation which empowers the youth of the local pittsburgh communities awesome that's really cool man go to christian instagram and go check that out and support awesome well, thank you guys for coming on. It's been an amazing episode. I uh, love having, you know, experts in the, in the field, and you guys are definitely two of them, along with, with Jake there. Um, this has been the Iceman Podcast, Brett Arkellian. Thanks for listening. And make sure you give us a follow or a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Music if you're so inclined to do so. For any questions or suggestions on further guests, follow us at Iceman Coaching on Twitter or on Instagram, and check out our website, icemankicking.com, for updates and new talks and podcasts. Check out our TikTok for the best clips of the newest episodes. Tune in next week for another awesome guest. I'm Brett Arkellian, and for everyone at the Iceman Podcast, so long and stay cool under pressure. Please pray. Roll another one, cause I'm winning in my photo.